started. Welcome everyone. I'm Candace Breyer, Chairperson of the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a nine-person volunteer citizen board appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the City Council. Our procedure this evening is as follows. First, we will hear from the Planning and Development Services Unit, represented tonight by Mr. John Barrett. Then the petitioner or his or her representative will make his or her presentation. Petitioners will have five minutes in which to make their presentation. Board members may ask questions of either the city or the petitioner. We will acknowledge any written comments received by the board. We will allow an appearing party to express their support or objections. The board will discuss the appeal and formulate a resolution to approve the appeal. Five affirmative votes of the board will be required for an appeal to be granted. Finally, any qualified party who is aggrieved by a decision of the board can appeal that decision to the Washtenaw County Circuit Court on a timely basis. Roll call, I am here. Mike Daniel. Here. Dave DeVardi. Here. Megan Peters. Here. Nicole Eisenman. Here. Todd Grant. Here. Elizabeth Nelson. Here. Charlotte Wilson. Here. We have a quorum. Um, next we have approval of the agenda. Are there any comments on the agenda? Um, I will note that um, I will need to recuse myself from the third item on our agenda this evening, petition ZBA 19028 um, for professional conflict of interests. Um, but otherwise, if there's any other comments on the agenda, if not, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Uh, we approve the agenda as presented. Thank you, Dave. Support? Second. From Todd. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Moving on to approval of minutes. We have minutes from the September 25th, 2019 ZBA meeting. Um, any comments or corrections to those minutes? If not, do I have a motion to approve I, the minutes? I move we approve the minutes as presented. Second. Todd, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, moving on to public hearings. First, we have petition ZBA 19029614 Sewell Boulevard. John? My name is John Barrett. I'm the zoning coordinator for the city of Ann Arbor. <coughs> the first application be before us this evening is ZBA 19-029. The address is 614 Sewell Boulevard. Forward design build representing the property owners are requesting a 17-foot variance from Table 5.171 single-family residential zoning district dimensions. The property is zoned R1D and has a 20-foot rear yard setback requirement. The owners are proposing to construct a new one-car garage and mudroom on the first floor and a master bedroom and bathroom on the second floor. The subject property is located on a corner lot at the intersection of Sewell Boulevard and Lutz Avenue. The home was built in 1926 and is approximately 1,332 square feet in size. The proposed addition will replace their existing detached garage and mudroom to construct a new attached addition to the home. The new first floor area will consist of a, the mudroom and expanded kitchen that will comprise 960 additional square feet. The second story master bedroom and bathroom will contain 924 square feet. A 1,048 square foot unfinished basement will be excavated for the project as well. If you'll turn your attention to the monitors, the first slide this evening is the zoning um, map that was is, uh, part of, you'll see the property is in the center highlighted in yellow. It's, like I said, it's at the corner of uh, Sewell and Lutz. Uh, the next slide is the neighborhood uh, zoning map showing existing conditions and surrounding properties. And the next slide is the zoomed in photo um, map of the property and you will see the, ex uh, the existing garage in this area right here and the, the rear setback is along this property line. And that is where they will be seeking the 17 foot variance from that required 20 foot rear setback. The next slide is the survey that was submitted with the application and you can see on, on the um, location where the existing <coughs> garage is right here. This is the um, demo site plan in the lower left corner and the hatched lines in red where the um, existing garage and the um, small mudroom will be demo demolished and then the uh, applicant submitted the new site plan and you see the yellow area where the proposed additions are to be. And then the distance to the property line, the three feet. The next slides are the floor plans that were submitted with the application. The garage is on this area and adjacent to the garage is the mudroom on the first floor and the expanded kitchen area. 
The next slide is the second floor showing the walk-in closet, master bath, and master bedroom on the second floor. <coughs> next following slides are the elevations that were submitted with the application. You see this is the south elevation standing on uh, Lutz Avenue looking directly at the proposed garage with the addition in the background. And then you see it from the east elevation with the proposed addition right here. And then the next north and west elevations with the ele uh, proposed addition where my cursor is. And then in the west elevation as well. This is a longitudinal section showing the different uh, cross sections of the additions and um, the garage and the, and the in relationship to the rest of the house. These are some conceptual designs, renderings that were submitted, what the um, proposed project will look upon completion. So the before and after photo that was submitted with the application, you see the before and then the after and what the finished product is proposed to look like. The next following slides are the slide, uh, the photos that I took when I made my site inspection. See the existing house from, the, um, from Sewell. And you see the side yard in relationship to the abutting property. This is looking at it from Lutz from the south elevation and looking directly at the garage and its existing relationship to the house as it sits now and adjacent to the abutting property. And this is how the two structures between the house and the garage currently are in their present state. Just another photo showing the relationship between the two properties. Looking directly across Sewell at a, a, a different perspective across the street. Another picture of the existing garage from the back. And that's the end of my presentation. I'll take any questions at this time. Thank you, John. Any questions for staff? The petitioners here, if you could please uh, step up, state your name for the record, sign in. You'll have five minutes. My name is Chad Weiler. I'm with Forward Design Build. Bill Barber with Forward Design Build. If you have a presentation, go ahead. You have yeah. five minutes. So basically, as stated um, on our application, there's a couple of defining points here. And I'm assuming you all received our application and have gone through it in great detail. Um, you know, the, the scope of the project really is quite impactful to our homeowners. They, they love their community. They love their neighborhood. They want to stay in the house and really make it more of a desirable home. It is a holder home. It does not currently meet their needs. They have a young child. Um, one of the homeowners does work from home, so she needs more of a desirable work environment for both herself and then her son to grow older in the house. Um, there is no currently a, a bathroom on the first floor that presents some livable uh, concerns for the homeowners. There's some other concerns um, that we have and I want to talk about a little bit more, but the scope of the project as defined by John and his presentation is it is a two-story addition. We are encroaching on the rear setback, 17 feet. Initially, we were under the assumption that considering it is a double frontage, uh, we did assume incorrectly, based on incorrect research on our part, um, that if it's a double frontage, that implies two side setbacks. And we're, we're fully understanding that that was incorrect at the time. So what we're proposing and asking acceptance on your behalf is to let us encroach 17 feet into that rear setback. Um, and there is a, a, another buildable area that's allowed by the current uh, restrictions. We just don't see that as a desirable approach 
based on, based on our design and the neighborhood's context. So that is one of our considerations in kind of our argument or our case here. Um, but again, the scope of the project is a two-story addition. The first floor does consist of an attached garage with a mudroom and powder room. Improved kitchen is included in a portion of that addition. On the second floor, it is a full master suite with a walk-in closet, a full bedroom, and a, and a, and a master bathroom. Now, we've listed as our kind of our hardship here is it is a corner lot. Um, corner lots present uh, quite a handful of challenges. Um, and one of those challenges is, um, and I'm reading my notes here, is that it, it does reduce, or if we look at the buildable area as a percentage, it, it does produce a smaller percentage in relationship to a non-corner lot. And I know there's been other variances that have been approved in the past based on that same type of argument. Um, the other argument that we want to state is that we prefer the east-west orientation. Now, if we look at the existing drawing that's on the screen currently, in the south side of, our, of the house is a, a, a buildable area that we are not encroaching in. But we, we see it best suited if we don't encroach on that and we're encroaching on what we're requesting as an increased variance of that 17 feet, and that's on the west side of the house. And one of our justifications for that is to keep context in relationship to the neighbor. The other thing per request of the homeowners is that they love the east-west orientation of the house. And what that means is basically the front of the house is off Sewell and the side of the house is off Lutz. Um, and the fact that the driveway is off Lutz and the front door is off Sewell, it's, it's a bit of a challenging site. Um, but again, we're under the impression based on our design experience that we want to preserve that corner and not infill what's allowed by the current zoning and that's why we're asking for a variance to kind of infill that rear portion off the existing garage. Our other hardship is we want to improve the existing conditions. You did see the existing photos that John took. That garage is considered a non-conforming structure. It is close to two feet from the property line. And by my understanding, that that means it's a non-conforming structure. And I also know that it has to be at least three feet from the house. I think our measurements state it's about 12 inches from the house. Um, so I think we're improving by just eliminating that garage and actually adding the new two-story addition because we're pulling it, the new proposed addition, away from the property line. So I think we're improving the existing conditions. Also, I mentioned updating the house to meet the homeowner's needs by including a first floor bathroom. Currently, they don't have a bathroom on the first floor. Um, and then one other thing I want to talk about is, you know, one of the things I've learned through this process is that this is such a desirable neighborhood. And as we walk the streets and introduced myself and our team to uh, Michelle and Jeff's neighbors, there was so much community approval of the project. We had 13 signed letters, 13 signed letters, and they were all adjacent neighbors of Michelle and Jeff's. So I think that should be considered when we kind of make our decision here for this variance approval. All right. Thank you very much. Questions for the petitioner? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, Mr. Weiler, just confirming on page two of your four-page um, typed application, the the envelope of the proposed house will actually be a foot less into the setback than the current building, correct? You're exactly right. Okay, thank you. Okay. So my reading is you're more than doubling the square footage of the house. So going from roughly 1,350 to almost 1,900 square feet. Yes, with the two-story addition now, I think that square footage does include the unfinished portion of the basement within the addition as well. And that was a, it does. a request by the homeowner for an unfinished portion for a workshop and additional storage. I'm just, I'm looking at... Are you looking at the plans or the application? I'm looking at the uh, description of the staff report where it says the original mm -hmm. building is 1,332 square feet in size. Yeah. Then below that it says 
the first floor, the new first floor area will be 960 additional square feet. And the second story master bedroom and bathroom will be 924 square feet. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving out the square foot unfinished basement, which will be excavated, I'm assuming, underneath all that. Um, but 960 plus 924, I get 1,884, which is more square foot. You're more than doubling the square footage of the house with this addition. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think you're right, sir. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions for the petitioner? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this petition? Can we have our homeowners speak? If they would like to, yes. Please state your name for the record, sign in. You'll have three minutes. Sure, Jeff Horowitz and Michelle Seeger. So, um, so I, I don't have much to add that uh, that Bill and Chad didn't uh, cover. Um, but you know, we just the, the just to emphasize the, the few key, key issues. One is the uh, the additional. This, Michelle works at home, and so having we, we have two bedrooms, and so we're needing a, a space for Michelle to to work at home, and having the the powder room on the first floor, which we don't have, have any existing uh, bathroom facilities on the first floor. Uh, I think that, you know, I want to ask about the, the square footage. I, I think that that may not be accurate. The, I don't think we're doubling the, the square footage. Um, the space of the garage is included in that. Okay. I think it is the garage. I think the square right. footage was included in that number. I think in that first floor number? Yes. I think it does, and that's why it seems a little inflated as well. Okay. So that may be my, my calculation is not doubling, and it, because of probably the, the garage on the first floor. But uh, you know, we love the neighborhood. We considered leaving, which was a very painful concept, but we uh, uh, decided to, to move in this direction, and we're really pleased. We love the, the, the area, the, the, our neighbors, um, and again, we have strong support from our adjacent and uh, neighboring uh, families in the, in the area. Our community is really important to us, and so we just really want to stay where we are. And thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Did you sign in? Did not. Is there anyone else to speak on this petition? I will note that we did receive letters of support from several of the neighbors. Um, 1407 Wakefield Avenue, 1405 Wakefield, 602 Sewell, 608 Sewell, 1310 Lutz, 1406 Lutz, 1404 Lutz, 1402 Lutz, 1405 Lutz, 700 Sewell, 1311 Lutz, 1309 Lutz, and 1306 West Madison. With that, we are in discussion. Todd? I don't have a problem with the upgrade. I think it's nice they're improving the neighborhood. What tilts the decision in my favor, I think I'll be voting yes, but I always wait to hear everybody else's comments, is that the proposed plan will be less non-conforming than the existing one. More specifically, it's going to encroach one foot less than the current building does. So they're moving away back from the lot line. And that's on the second page of the application. And I think that's good. I think the size of um, the improvement is neither here nor there with the criteria we have to look at. So I think it's going to be less non-conforming than the current structure, which is good. Okay. <clears throat> this is one I've, uh, I'm grappling with uh, largely because of all the community support for this, all the neighbors coming out in favor of it. However, I'm when I this 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 building is so close already, and the, there is no there is no backyard. There is no essentially you're asking to abandon all all the rear setbacks already. The disadvantage of corner lots is. Uh, double front setbacks, but you've got still within that, you've got space to build a substantial addition. And I've seen McMansions going up in this area on Virginia and some of the other streets in the area, and I'm kind of watching the neighborhood change from 2,000 square foot homes to over 3,000 square foot homes. Um, I'm reluctant to give such a substantial variance to allow that to happen 
um, especially when I see the possibility for an architect of your stature or the stature of many architects in our community to be able to build within existing parameters. Um, given all of that, I'm despite, and I, this is what really tears my heart out, despite all the neighborhood support, I'm going to have to vote against this. Any further discussion? Elizabeth? I, I have to say I, I share some of Dave's concerns. Um, I do understand how desirable this neighborhood is. And um, I, I, it, it, I, the fact that there's another way to go, the, the idea that it would be preferable to go east-west rather than going south, I, that, doesn't, that doesn't feel to me like the kind of hardship that we should be using as a rationale for our decisions here. I agree with the decreasing, it's decreasing the nonconformity as um, Todd has stated. The one thing that, um, one of the criteria that we base our decision on is the variance request is the minimum necessary to achieve reasonable use of the land or structure. I'm not sure that this is the minimum necessary. You're going from a, um, a 10.4 foot times 20.5 foot garage to, um, a substantial addition to the home. So I, I'm, I'm leaning towards voting no on this item. Yeah, Nicole? Um, one, so one thing that I'm kind of grappling with in this is that the site is a little bit unique in that the driveway is essentially, you cannot build a garage here, well I guess you kind of could, but an awkward garage entrance without having to build something in the rear setback. Um, generally, I am along the lines of if there's a space you should build in it. Um, I also am considering the point that was made in the packet about if an addition was made on the to the south, that that addition um, would, the relationship with the home to the west on Lutz that um, kind of front setback re relationship would be a little different, potentially. Mm -hmm. Somebody could, they could build out to that, um, that setback line and it would re change that relationship. So I'm on the fence here still. Any further discussion or motion? <clears throat> Petition ZBA 19 029, 614 Sewell Boulevard. Variance. Based on the following findings of fact and in accordance with the established standards for approval, the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants the following variance from Chapter 55 Unified Development Code Table 5 colon 17 1, Single Family Zoning District. A variance of 17 feet from the 20 foot rear setback to allow construction of a new one car garage and mudroom on the first floor and a master bedroom and bathroom on the second floor. The construction is to be built per the submitted plans. A, the alleged practical difficulties are peculiar to the property and result from conditions which do not exist generally throughout the city. That the practical difficulties which will result from a failure to grant the variance include substantially more than mere inconvenience, inability to attain a higher financial return or both. C, the variance of granted will not significantly affect surrounding properties. D, the circumstances of the variance request are not self-imposed. E, the variance request is the minimum necessary to achieve reasonable use of the land or structure. Motion, do we have support from Mike? Dave. No. Megan. Yes. Nicole. Yes. Todd. Yes. Elizabeth. No. Charlotte. No. I vote yes, Mike. No. 
The request is denied. Moving on to petition ZBA 19030, 1323 through 1325, Franklin Boulevard. John. All right, Robert O'Reilly, the property owner, is requesting an 11 parking space variance from section 5.19.2 required parking. The property is zoned office, and the owner is proposing a new beauty salon use. Personal service uses require one parking space per 100 square feet of floor area. The building is 1,187 square feet in size and will require 12 parking spaces. There is currently one parking space adjacent to the structure that meets code requirements. The subject property is located on a corner lot at the intersection of Franklin Boulevard and West Stadium Boulevard. The property was built in 1950. Currently, the property is undergoing a change of use from a medical office to a beauty salon. The property has the one parking space in the, in the, um, lo located in the side yard, which qualifies as that approved parking space. There are only interior alterations being proposed for the business. There are no planned additions or exterior changes to the building. You'll turn your attention to the monitor. You'll see the first slide is the zoning map and the highlighted parcel in the center, like I previously stated, right at the corner of West Stadium and Franklin Boulevard and just northwest of Pioneer High School to further orient you. The next slide is the aerial map showing uh, surrounding properties, existing neighborhood conditions. And you see the zoomed in aerial photos, the next slide of the subject property with the driveway and the relationship to Franklin Boulevard. And it backs up to West Dayton. <coughs> the next slide is the boundary survey that was submitted with the application. And we have a furniture equipment layout plan showing uh, proposed conditions on the interior of the business. The following slides are when I took my um, site inspection. You see it standing from Franklin dire looking directly at the, uh, the subject property. And this is a photo of the property. They still had the survey stakes in and the relationship to the adjacent property to the um, East. This is looking at down at the property from the sidewalk on Franklin or on from West Stadium Boulevard. And just another photo, another perspective looking at the subject property from West Stadium Boulevard. And this is looking down Franklin towards Stadium Boulevard, yeah. the front of the property. I will take any questions at this time. Thanks, John. Questions for Steph? Yeah. Mike. John, so there's an exist, there was an existing business that's left this location? Correct. Mm -hmm. and the property has changed ownership, and the new ownership is proposing a beauty salon, right. which is a personal service, which is um, allowed, is the only personal service that's allowed in an office district. But since it was non-conforming previously, the change of use triggers that the property now meets um, uh, zoning requirements, and that one of the, the it meets everything except the parking. And it has one parking space currently, if you look at uh, the slide where my cursor is, adjacent to the, to the building. Got it. And so, and so the, the, the reason the previous owner could operate their business is they were just there long enough before the zoning exactly. came in? Okay. It was nonconforming or grandfathered and had been in uh, business practicing at that location for decades. Yep. And then this, Franklin, is there street parking a lot on both sides? Um, there, there is, I believe, I can, yes, there is. There, you can park on both sides of uh, Franklin. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Steph? Todd? Is there parking along the stadium on the front of the building there? No. Or not allowed? No. Not allowed? Okay. Dick? The, what was the use prior to this? It was a medical use. So a dental or medical? I think it was a dental office at one time, and yeah. then it changed to a medical type office, and it may have been something speech therapy related. Um, the applicant knows a little bit more history on it than I do, but that's uh, from our discussion, it's always been in either an office type setting for medical or dental. So I noted there were two headdresses mm -hmm. and two front doors. Were there two separate businesses there at one point? Not that I'm aware of. Was it zoned office because uh, the doctor's office was there, or like which came first? 
Like it's just one little mm -hmm. office uh, zoning. Uh, and so the property was built in 1950, yeah. and the zoning ordinance came into effect in approximately 1965. So it probably had been a medical or dental office used prior to the adoption of the zoning ordinance, and the zoning ordinance adoption put this into a non-conforming status. And as time has evolved with parking requirements being put into place, has further put that into non-conformity. Gotcha. Any other questions? Are there any um, office uses that would not require the a variance in parking? There are other office uses that would reduce the parking requirement. The beauty salon has the highest ratio of one to 100. There's some other ones that might require one to 300 or one to 400, but either way, there's no one's gonna be able to meet the parking requirement because it's just a driveway right now. You could not site plan a parking lot to fit on this, on this property. So no it's, matter what office use went in here, it would be non-conforming. <coughs> Or, I mean, they would as long as it was a medical or dental type office, they could continue, but the change in ownership and the change of use has triggered the um, request for the variance. So a changing from a, 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 dent or a medical office to a beauty salon triggers a change in use, could a, a reoccupancy. Could a medical marijuana uh, operation as a medical operation go in there? without triggering the parking change? It's probably too close to the school. Um, yeah, well, one, it wouldn't meet the distance requirement from a school, and then two, um, it would not support a retail use there. So, like I said, the only um, personal service that's allowed is a beauty salon, and that's a uh, use-specific standard in the code. There are a number of other different personal services, but beauty salon's the only one allowed in the office district. Like a barber shop could not go in this location. And you can just see this question coming. The distinction between a beauty salon and a barber shop is. So I have ran that through my head a bunch, and I would say it's based on volume. And this is the only way I can describe it would be volume. Beauty salons generally tend to operate on appointments. Um, Barber shops probably have more of a retail component, um, higher turnover rate, 10 minute haircut as opposed to an hour. So it's not a void. My haircuts take about void one minute. Thing. It's a <laughs> of, uh, this, um, I think so. I, I think that's where they were, they were going at the time. I, and also with the appointment only, you could, you could control the parking situation. Sure. We could have two appointments. There's two, two, um, cars being generated, two employees, so you have four parking spaces. A barber shop, you couldn't control that with, as a retail, you couldn't control, you could have mm -hmm. 10 people coming all at once. Okay. Well said. Mm -hmm. Could like a private, own, was, was this house for sale on the market for like a homeowner to buy? Or is it just being, was it just sold as? Um, I think we'll have to ask the applicant that. I don't know how the, how, the, how it was marketed. I'm sure it probably was marketed as a, medical dental type use for the higher potential, but if someone wanted to convert this to residential, they could. You can do residential can do in a um, office district. Okay, I think that was my question. Thanks. So um, in our packet, it's explained that the people who are running this business are, are gonna actually be able to walk to it, which is a great argument for why less parking is necessary. Um, but I'm curious if the decision that we make um, would apply to a future business, like if they, if the salon were to sell to another salon or that didn't have such a situation, or do you, do you follow what I'm saying? I do, and the variance um, would, will run with the land. Okay, thank but you. But it would have to go from, if it a beauty salon to a beauty salon, or it would go back to a medical or dental office. Because the only, like I said, the only retail type, and I hate to, I don't even want to call it retail, but only, the only personal service that's allowed is a beauty salon. So it's either gonna be a beauty salon or it's gonna be medical, dental, office type uh, uses. Gotcha, okay, so it's pretty limited it's use. Very, it's very limited. Okay, uh, I, I, I can just throw out there that I, I live in this neighborhood, I live up the street from it, so I know a little bit about this street. Any other questions for Steph? Um, just for clarification, yeah. John, so the Beauty salon or medical dental, they're the only two possible future uses for the building? Any, well, 
a, a beauty salon in the personal service category, could but there, any there any other, other uses that are allowed in the office district. Could. What would some of those be, just any? Ooh. I don't, I, I don't have the ordinance in front of me if you don't know. I, I do, okay. but in order for me to state every use in the office district, you know, right? Every use, but give um, me a flavor. Yeah. I'll give you a flavor. All right. Well, welding. No, so welding would not I, be I, an I allowed use. So. <laughs> um, CPA. So. Would that an account be allowed? <laughs> so, general office, medical dental, a nonprofit corporation, a bank or a credit union or financial service. Yeah. Okay. Not sure how one would go in there and fit in this tight, tight of a uh, location, but things like that. Um, personal services and an artist studio. Mm -hmm. okay. Mobile food vending service. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for John? All right. If the petitioner could please come forward, state your name for the record, and sign in. You'll have five minutes. Alyssa Magridis. Robert O'Reilly. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to start by saying I do appreciate the concern about my business in the neighborhood. Um, I want to assure you that's of the utmost importance to me as well. This is my neighborhood. We've lived around the corner from this building for almost 10 years. I walked by it many times, and when I saw the for sale sign and learned that a beauty salon would be a permitted use, I thought it might be the perfect place for the business that my family's run on Main Street for almost 40 years. I care about this neighborhood tremendously. We have excellent relationships with our neighbors. Some of them are already clients. Others have said they're looking forward to being able to walk up the street to get their hair cut. I never would have attempted to acquire the building if I didn't know that we would be very quiet, very good neighbors to this business. There's two businesses side by side there, and it is, you know, a consideration that it's in a residence, and I never would have even attempted to acquire it if I wasn't sure that we would be very good neighbors. Um, in fact, the woman that I bought it from said in a letter to you that she had other offers, and it was my commitment to the neighborhood and my explanation of the quiet way we run our salon that made her want to sell to me. I know that for many people, the idea of a beauty salon sounds like a loud place with a lot of coming and going and a lot of music and maybe chemical smells. I want to assure you that's not the kind of salon that we have. We're very small. There's never more than two stylists. We play classical music. Our clients are established professionals and retirees that have been with us for a very long time. Uh, we only work during the day, Tuesday through Friday, so we are not there in the evenings and we're not there in the, on the weekends. So in terms of parking, I don't see an issue there. Um, because of how small we are, the parking situation as is, is actually more than we would ever require. Um, there's, you know, the driveway would accommodate more cars. There's street parking right out front. There's parking all the way down the street. Um, and aside from being impossible to install on our small parcel, a 12-spot 12 12 parking lot wouldn't work with the neighborhood, nor is unnecessary, impermeable surface in line with the city's emphasis on environmental sustainability. It's not the best choice for the environment, the neighborhood, nor is it needed. My dad and I will be walking to work. Many of our clients have said they're looking forward to walking to work. There's a bus stop directly out front. We could install a bike rack as a means for clients choosing alternative ways of transportation. The way the building is situated on the outermost edge of the neighborhood minimizes the traffic impact to the neighbors. For decades, our building and the one next door have been used as offices. The previous owner outlined she would have group therapy. She sometimes rented the other side to another therapist. In all of that time of people coming and going, she never had any complaints from the neighbors. In fact, we got an email from a neighbor a couple nights ago wishing us luck tonight and saying that she is directly across the street. She's never been negatively impacted by the business there, and she doesn't see an issue with us as well. Um, 
I feel confident the salon would be even more suitable to the neighborhood than the previous uses as we will be closed by the time the neighbors even arrive home for the day. Nearly 50 Ann Arbor citizens have written in support of the variance being granted and in testimony of the quiet way we run our business. Many are here tonight in a show of support. People from the neighborhood have signed a petition in support of the variance being granted. I've lived in Ann Arbor my entire life. My parents opened the business the month after I was born. It served Ann Arbor for nearly 40 years. I'm asking you to grant the parking variance, knowing that my business will be harmonious with the neighborhood, that the neighbors support it, as do longstanding members of the community. In granting this variance, you'll be supporting a woman-run business that's committed to the environment, the neighborhood, and the city. Thank you. And I will just add in terms of what you guys were speaking about before, I did look it up and there's really no um, use for this space as an office or anything commercial um, that wouldn't require a variance other than the medical dental. Even an artist studio requires two legal parking spaces. Um, so I could not find one use for it that um, we could rent it out as, if not a medical dental use, if we don't get the variance for the salon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for the petitioner? Yes. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I've walked by it a lot because I li <laughs> I live off the street on Ardmore. Okay. Um, I, it, help me understand. I don't, there's a second office. Like right I, next door is an architect's office. So there's sort oh, of two okay. commercial or office buildings in this residential neighborhood. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. That that was just sort of satisfying my curiosity. Yeah. It's <laughs> and it's like way down. Like, well, anyway, I bike up and down stadium. So I yeah. 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 Good. So I'm looking at the furniture equipment layout. Yes. Um, and I've got two questions. How many yes. staff do you employ? Um, it's mostly my dad and I. We have one person who works between five and ten hours a week. Um, okay. So, but we wouldn't overlap. There'd just be two stylists at a time. But I, I notice on the furniture layout, you've got, like, in the two halves, you've got. We have four. six in one six seats for clients in one part and five seats in the other part. So we have four styling stations. Um, that's the way we have it set up now. One of them is empty. People like to use it to put their makeup on after they've had their hair done. And then a styling station for each of us. To the other side are processing chairs. If someone's sitting having their hair color processed or having it dried. And then we have a waiting area. And then also shampoo area, two shampoo chairs. So, yeah, I mean, it's clear from the outpouring of support for your business that you have a, a very loyal customer base and it's an appreciated business. I'm just concerned that when we grant variances like this, they run with the property. Yep. And when it, it eventually transfers, maybe you know, if your dad handed the business down to you, maybe you'll hand it down too. My that, daughter. The next generation. <laughs> but um, I'm just wondering if somebody else, a different uh, beauty salon, bought the place, they could just stack it out with half a dozen stylists. Um, I understand. I mean, as I said, we have no plans to leave the neighborhood. We would be very conscious of that. And actually, our plan is we would like to keep this. And then when I'm done doing hair, we would probably plan to turn it into a residence and rent it, have it be a rental property. We don't have any plans to sell it in the future. And I think the drawing is a little misleading. It makes it look quite spacious. If you tried to put six styling chairs in there, it'd be tight. you couldn't even walk through there. It would be it's generous. Yeah, okay. it feels little. <laughs> any other questions for the petitioner? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this petition? If so, yep, come forward, state your name for the record, and sign in. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jim Pearson, an Ann Arbor resident and a faithful customer of Lockie Salon for probably 25 years, even though I don't look that old. <laughs> My wife would be here in some active support also. Unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, she's having back surgery tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. So she insisted that I be here 
in full support of Baki and his daughter, Alyssa. And I want to give you a little background. This one point I don't think has ever been touched upon tonight so far. We've been, uh, again, going to uh, Lockheed Salon, both I and my wife, for approximately 25 years. And they have a spacious parking lot now. And over those 25 years, and we've gone at various times of the week, we have never seen more than three, at the most, four vehicles in that parking lot. One occupied by Lockheed's car, one occupied by ours, perhaps one occupied by Alyssa, and another customer. There is never a line going out the door waiting to get a seat. They have the schedule extremely well-timed, so there's never a backup. Consequently, there's never a need for more than parking spaces for those people who are being serviced by Lockheed and his daughter. And occasionally, the third person mentioned by Alyssa. So, as I understand, a need for 12 spaces is, pardon the expression, significant overkill for this business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? Hi, good evening. Carson Honka, Ann Arbor resident. Um, I too just wanted to be here tonight to um, provide some support for the, for the petitioners for uh, two reasons primarily. Uh, first, to uh, share my experience with how they have operated their business as a long-term customer of theirs um, and how they've engaged with the community and always sought to be uh, uh, helpful and, and considerate neighbors. Uh, I wanted to share that with you to the extent you may find that uh, useful in understanding how they may operate with this variance on the edge of this residential, non-residential zoning transition. Um, and secondly, I wanted to share a couple of thoughts about the zoning impact on this parcel. Um, as somebody who has spent a lot of time thinking about zoning in the city, and again, in particular, around that, that residential, non-residential transition. Um, so first, I've known the, the petitioners for decades uh, as a customer, a friend, and for four years, I had the, the privilege of re representing them and all of the, the businesses on that stretch of South Maine as their council representative. Uh, and so I've seen them in a number of contexts uh, in the community. Uh, they've been an anchor small business on the edge of downtown, as they, they mentioned previously, for uh, nearly 40 years. Uh, and during that time, uh, and, and I've known them for a good chunk of that 40 years, um, I've seen them operate their business with the highest integrity. I know many, many of their customers uh, and always hear only the most glowing descriptions of them as individuals, business owners, and neighbors. Um, I've observed also on many occasions how graciously and cooperatively they've worked together with neighbors and other stakeholders to make their little corner of the community better. Uh, and that is to say they're deeply anchored in this community and I know that it's very important to them to be good neighbors. Um, so secondly, uh, uh, around the, the variance in question here, um, in the case of this lot, uh, as you've heard uh, from previous speakers, uh, the required parking isn't necessary. And in fact, you know, <laughs> to the extent that you could add any additional parking there, it would significantly uh, negatively impact the neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, I have significant experience with their business, and uh, when they operate with uh, two service providers, as is their plan, I've never seen them uh, have more than a couple of cars, customers' cars at the, at the business. Uh, similar to what the previous speaker was sharing with you. 
Uh, and so also 12 spaces here appears to be too much in the extreme um, when the existing uh, space is sufficient. Um, and I would add, as, as I understand it, the uh, use of the space will actually be significantly lower or certainly not greater than the existing use. Um, so my guess is that means my time is up. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to kind of summarize uh, that these, these folks are longstanding small business owners in the community. Um, and the required parking for this particular lot doesn't seem to be in the best interest of the, of the neighborhood. Um, running a small business is hard, but the community benefits a lot from independent local businesses. Um, uh, Lockie and Alyssa have created a strong business over four decades, um, have many deeply loyal and satisfied customers. Uh, it's my hope, and I'm sure many of our neighbors, that they continue to be able to, to operate in this parcel. Thanks for your time. And thank you also for your service. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak on this? Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Suni Travan, and I really didn't plan to speak today, but I just want to say a couple of things. So I'm a periodontist. I work at U of M. I've been a customer of Lucky's and Alyssa for over like almost 14 years now, so it's been a long time. I can't add much more to what everybody already said to what kind of morals and val uh, values they have. Um, also, they will, they're the kind of people that will take a loss if it contributes to the community. But one thing I wanted to say, so being a dentist, it sounds like if I were to buy the lot, I could open up a practice with no issues, right? So if I put a chair there, and I would like to try to put two, or, or, although it's a much smaller production that we like to have, so if I have one chair, I would need at least four to six parking lots at any time. If I tried to put two chairs, which I would at the minimum, with a hygienist and myself, an assistant, a front desk person, if not in a couple of patients, and a third one waiting in the waiting room, because sometimes we do run behind. So I think it would be much more disruptive to the community than anything that Lucky or Alyssa would ever have with like two cars. And most of my appointments with them, I haven't seen more than two cars um, in the parking lot personally. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sign, sign Can in. you please sign in? Thank you. Anyone else here who wishes to speak? Okay. Seeing no one, I will. Oh, yes. Okay, uh, my name is Carl Huter. I'm the owner of 1321 Franklin Boulevard, immediately adjacent to this parcel. And I've owned that property for 28 years. It's also my pediatrician's office, and I was a client of his from 1952 until 1964. Uh, this is a variance of 92% of the legal required on-site parking required to allow this change of use on this property as governed by the Ann Arbor Unified Development Code. This is not about the petitioner, and their good reputation. The variance being requested runs with the land in perpetuity. Protections for this residential neighborhood and public safety provided in the code are meant to extend into the future ownerships of this parcel. Subsequently, the issue is not about the existing petitioner and their use, but what can happen to the uses of this property and the detrimental effect it could have on the residential neighborhood if one of the other 47 allowed uses could move onto the site without having to provide adequate required parking. The existing building can accommodate up to 10 persons by code. There are a number of these small office owned parcels in or immediately adjacent to residential neighborhoods in the city, so the condition is not unique. In the office zoning district, personal service uses are recognized as generating the highest office use volumes and so have a greater number of parking spaces associated with their use type. This is per respected nationally recognized land planning professionals and research and is accepted and incorporated into the code. 
There is an existing hair salon and barbershop on the market in a soft cell in the West Stadium Shopping Center, six blocks from this property. The petitioner failed to do their due diligence in purchasing the property. The code is very clearly written. If they had spoken to the Ann Arbor planning staff or hired a professional expert in these matters, they would have walked them through the issues associated with this particular property mm -hmm. prior to the purchase. Relying on a seller for information to fall under the prudent purchaser's buyer beware radar. Failing to do due diligence is not a practical difficulty and hardship because it is unfortunately self-imposed. Lack of knowledge of the law does not relieve one of the responsibility to obey the law. There are many uh, traffic issues involved in Franklin and having looked at it for 28 years, although called out as a 25 mile an hour speed limit zone, Franklin Boulevard has excessive traffic speed from persons coming east off the stadium at the convenient easy angled downhill exit route at speeds in excess of 40 miles per hour. To such an extent that the Anaheim Police Department does two or three speed enforcement events along this frontage each year. There's an AATA bus stop at the property which compounds the traffic problem, blocking views and constricting traffic flow. Vehicles exiting the property need to back out onto Franklin against the above traffic issues and a number of other items I've listed. I hereby urge the Ann Arbor Zoning Board of Appeals deny this application for variance in requesting a 92% relief in the legally required on-site parking requirement for this property as the petitioner has failed to show hardship and practical difficulty not self-imposed and the change in use allowed will open the opportunity for the increase in the intensity for future uses incompatible with this location having a detrimental impact on the character of this residential neighborhood as is allowing higher traffic usage to occur with future owners and imposes a public safety issue along the highly traffic section of Franklin Boulevard. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? All right, seeing no one, I will note. Do you oh, yes, sir. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, no oh, it's, not, not? it's not court. You don't get a rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> I was informed by John that we would. Sorry. I thought he could have a rebuttal, but. Well, if he gets your discretion, Candace. Sure, why not? You have three minutes. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, uh, one point I wanted to clarify is that this condition we find ourselves in is not self imposed. Um, we feel like we, we did our due diligence. Uh, prior to closing on the property, we reached out to the city and explained the situation in our plans and we were led to believe that we wouldn't run into any problems or require a variance. Further, the seller's disclosure statement for the property, I understand you can only rely on the seller to some extent, but that document is required by Michigan law and you have to rely on it to a certain extent. And we were led to believe in the seller disclosure statement that there were legal parking spaces on the property much greater than the one that we've discussed tonight. Um, the third point I want to make is that there are other uses we can convert this property to. One of them John and I have discussed is converting it to student housing. He's made the argument that he's seen that happen a lot in this area and that arguably that could be the highest and best use. However, we live in this neighborhood. I'm not sure I want six students living at this property. Um, the parking requirements, number of cars that would be there if you had six students would definitely exceed what we're planning to put in into this space if you grant the variance. So I think our proposed use is far more harmonious than what's possible here. Um, if we convert it to residential, as I understand it, we wouldn't need any kind of variance. That's a permitted conversion from the commercial zoning it's at down to residential, and so we would go through the normal building permit process um, to convert this building to student housing. And I just don't think that fits with the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have a yeah, Todd. Mr. Riley, you may yes. or may not know, not uh, denigrating whatever due diligence you did, but it's extremely difficult to get a stopple against the city. I, I, I completely understand it, and I agree with that. Okay. I'm just making the point that we felt like we did as much as we possibly could before closing on the property and, and just to refute the argument that we just kind of were blindly purchasing the property. But I agree with you. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. 
Yes, Todd. Should we get some discussion? Sure, let's be Six, a discussion. Already, I will, I will note very quickly that off. we did receive <laughs> numerous letters of support, um, I think well over 50, um, as well as a letter of opposition from um, Carl Huter, who also spoke this evening. So with that, we are now in discussion. Todd. I promise to take less than five minutes. <laughs> So, you know, of course, Mr. Huter is right. I mean, the petitioner, they have a very well organized, very sympathetic, well put together um, explanation why their particular use would be nice for the place. But as we all know, because these things run to the land, meaning that whatever we decide tonight would go with a future subsequent owner years from now or, you know, decades from now, it, it d describes the land that has gotten. So it's, it's not... Um, it's not to denigrate the personal appeal, but that, that really isn't the deciding factor. Nonetheless, I do agree with what Mr. Pearson said, one of the other commenters, that 12 parking spaces is, as he put it, I think, significant overkill for this space. I think I'm leaning to approving this, and that's because this is a boundary property. I mean, every neighborhood has properties at the end which are buffers, and don't quite fit in the neighborhood and interface with the next property. This is right on stadium. <coughs> there is a, an AATA bus stop. So the history has been that people probably do park on Franklin if there are two or three cars. There's, from what um, John said, there's no parking on stadium. So it doesn't quite necessarily fit in with all the T's cross and the I's dotted. But for me, because it is a boundary property, and because there are really only, in addition to student housing, two possible uses for this building, I'm comfortable in um, granting this variance. That's what I'm leading toward right now. But I'd like to hear from the other folks here. Okay. <coughs> I've got a question for our staff. So, uh, John, there's one legal parking space right now? Correct. But is that, it looks to me like you could stack parking there. Is that because that, stacked parking doesn't count? Correct. That, yeah, that would not meet the um, parking lot requirements. We wouldn't count stacked parking. Okay. But functionally, if, say, the two stylists parked in the driveway and blocked each other in, there would still be room for a third car potentially at the back. You could fit more than one car functionally in the driveway, I guess. Is yes. I, I, I just, in, in, I did go by the site. And if you parked all the way to the back of the building um, and came up to the, on that side, the front setback of 15 feet, I believe you could get um, at least three cars and maybe four, depending on the size of the cars. And that's what was my observation when I was there. But that would be that would require stacking in the parking. That's correct. So I would agree with the statement that you can fit multiple cars in the driveway, but they would not meet the requirements of the code, which would be a nine foot wide by eighteen foot long parking space with um, drive aisle width requirements also. Fair enough. Okay. Yes, Elizabeth. I I, I don't I, I'm impressed by the number of people who have um, have such strong support for this project based on based on what, what lovely feelings they have for the family and like I don't I don't know anything about Lockheed Salon or the family but just just living in this neighborhood and imagining such a business on that corner sounds like a lovely idea to me um, and I I I think that it's it's consistent with a lot of values that we we think about as a community like. The, the number of people who live in this neighborhood who could then like walk to the salon and it like it I, I don't I don't understand an argument of it being disruptive at all like to me I wish that we had more businesses like this um, like Todd said like sort of in an in a border property that's a little I mean I don't know that I would want to live on that corner facing stadium like as a residence it's or it would be a sort of less appealing but for this use it, it just it seems like a very a very nice thing to have in the neighborhood. And when it was previously a speech pathologist, I remember walking by and biking by, and and thinking it was interesting to have this like one little pocket of a business 
I, I just, I, I, I have to support this. I just, I feel like this is, this would, it would, I wish there were more businesses like this, just sort of unobtrusively tucked into neighborhoods like this. I think this is a, this is a lovelier way for our community to function. Dave. <clears throat> As everybody who has served with me knows, I'm generally not supportive of large parking variances. Um, I'm grappling with this largely because when I, you know, this is the kind of use that is not um, damaging to a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood. In fact, in some ways, it augments the quality of the neighborhood. And I grew up in the 1960s on Dewey Street, and at that time, there was a hi-fi repair at one end of Dewey Street and Clegg's Market at the end, other end of Dewey Street, both of which preceded zoning laws. Um, friends of mine lived over by Ba School where there uh, was East Jefferson Market. Um, McCoy's up on North Main, um, right next to the, what was the community center there. Those are the kinds of businesses that were not existing in neighborhoods and non-conforming that are the kinds of things that really added, um, I don't know how to say it, je ne sais quoi, some, some, <laughs> something to the type of residential neighborhoods we have throughout the city. Um, I, I am swayed by the outpouring of support. Um, I also, on looking at the site, I could see that the stylists could easily park in back even though those aren't legal spaces. And there are two hour spaces in front. Um, there are probably enough for four cars in front. And I know your neighbor uh, Carl Huger, Huter, the architect, um, has use for some of those spaces as well because I've used them. Um, I think I'm going to support this even though it goes against my nature to, to be oppositional to um, parking variances of this sort. Um, s somehow I wish we could build our or make some changes in the code to allow this kind of stuff to happen with, without having to come to us. I've already done that for you once this past year, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> well, th thank you very much. But we'll keep the work flowing. <laughs> sure. Um, may I ask a question for staff? Yeah, sure. Um, John, uh, since this variance is per the submitted plans, would a future change in use require a variance, or would this parking variance apply? Like if it went to this hair salon and then back to a doctor's office, um, would they be required to come back to this board for a variance? No. No. No, they would not. Okay. Any additional discussion or motion? Mike? Uh, just real quick, I'm swayed by a lot of what I hear from my fellow commissioners, um, and I appreciate the impassioned arguments of, of everyone here. I just want to note, I just. I would find it highly unlikely that a bunch of uh, undergrads would move into this place. <laughs> but uh, just, I understand you're making the best argument for your case, but I'm just noting that. It, okay. All right, well, I, again, I don't think this is a desirable area for student housing, and I also don't think that argument doesn't hold a lot of sway with me, but all right. Yes, I'll listen. Okay, so the, the other thing that I'm considering is that it is a relatively small building. Um, would there be any um, any review if a future owner decided to stack on top and like build it higher and turn it into something much bigger? That would end up going through the site plan review process. Okay. And so. So the site plan review process would include people noting, oh, they have a variance and they have like way less parking than technically they should. Correct. So there would be a review of. But if a additional square footage, more stories would increase the requirement for more parking, and then that may go over the threshold of what's being considered this evening. And so they would possibly have to go through another variance process. Okay. So. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, I, the small size of this building is the other argument I would say in favor of allowing the variance, just because I don't, I don't even if it was a different owner in different circumstances or a slightly different business, like I just I don't see how the building has much capacity 
to ever generate that much need for parking. I just want to follow up on our councilman's uh, question or councilwoman's question. So let's say, so we're granting, if we grant this variance, we're granting a variance of 11 spaces from the requirement. We're not saying there's only one required on the site, just 11 space variance. So let's say somebody, a future owner, kept an office use here and built, say, a duplex residential upstairs units on top that would require parking as well so they'd still have to provide more parking for those not for a residential uses. not for residential a residential duplex would only require one and a half more parking spaces so it'd still fall within the parameters of this 11 space variance but well, plus <clears throat> plus the the office the use that we're so if they're required a site plan review, if Not, there's a, if well, there's a if there's this use down below which requires twelve spaces, and a duplex above which requires a one and a half, so they would have to spend, they would have to have thirteen and a half. We're giving them an eleven right. space variance, so that developer would have to put enough space for three slots. Would be my reading. Correct. I'm not sure how. A Correct, but you're starting to get into uh, yeah. We're starting to get into. Uh, conceptual theories and right, okay. second stories and third stories and I don't see those scenarios taking place but if they were then any additional future uses additional square footage would have to meet the code for parking and we would have to find out what it is at that point okay. any further discussion Does somebody have a motion Elizabeth um, petition ZBA 19-030-1323-1325 Franklin Boulevard variance based on the following findings of fact and in accordance with the established standards for approval the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby grants the following variance from chapter 55 United Development Code section 5.19.2 required parking a variance of 11 parking spaces from the required 12 parking spaces the construction do I have to read all of that Yes. Do I? Okay. <laughs> the construction is to be built per the submitted plans. The alleged practical difficulties are peculiar to the property and result from conditions which do not exist generally throughout the city. B, that the practical difficulties which will result from a failure to grant the variance include substantially more than mere inconvenience, inability to attain a higher financial return or both. C, the variance, if granted, will not significantly affect surrounding properties. D, the circumstances of the variance request are not self-imposed. E, the variance request is the minimum necessary to achieve the re reasonable use of the land or structure. Motion, do I have support? From Todd? Todd. Uh, yes. Elizabeth. Yes. Charlotte. Yes. I vote yes. Mike. Yes. Dave. Yes. Megan. Yes. Nicole. Yes. The request is granted. <laughs> Excuse me, excuse me, we're still having a meeting. Excuse me, can you please move out of the meeting space? We have one we have one more case this evening. All right. Moving on to petition ZBA 19028-3439-17 Research Park Drive. I'm going to step out. Dave, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> So it says you're not even allowed to cheer.
Okay, uh, this is a variance request, CBA 19-28, 3915, and 3917 Research Park Drive. Um, I'm Dave Devardi, the vice chair, and since our chair is, has to recuse herself, I'll step in and chair the meeting uh, while this case is under review. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to our staff for presentation of the staff report. Okay, before we go further, um, in the staff report, there is a typo or a, an error, and I want to call that out. It, it's going to be the um, variance from Section 5.20, and that's from landscaping, screening, and buffering. It's also on your agenda. It was advertised correctly, but in the staff report, I just uh, did not stipulate it correctly. So with that being said, this is v ZBA case 19 or 28, 028. The address is 3915 and 3917 Research Park Drive. International Transmission Company, also known as ITC, is representing the property owners tonight and seeking a variance from Section 5.20, Landscaping, Screening, and Buffering. The requested variance is to allow the removal of re required vegetation in the high voltage electric transmission line easement areas only. <coughs> ITC has the authority under the Michigan Uniform Condemnation <coughs> Procedures Act to seek a variance to assist landowners that are put in a nonconformity as a result of a taking. This uh, state le uh, legislature is state statute MCL 2135.54, and it reads, if the acquisition of a portion of a parcel of property actually needed by an agency would leave the remainder of the parcel in nonconformity with the zoning ordinance, the agency before or after acquisition may apply for a zoning ordinance for the remainder, zoning variance for the remainder of the parcel. In determining whether to grant the zoning variance, the governmental entity having jurisdiction to grant the variance shall consider the potential benefits of the public use for which the property would be acquired, in addition to those criteria applicable under the relevant zoning, zoning statute, ordinance, or regulation. Without the variance, the property will fall into a nonconforming status and will never be able to comply with the UDC. As a result of the easement, ITC has the right to remove vegetation in the easement areas only and parking lot areas located within the easement area. This is a 150-foot easement right-of-way. It's a three-mile transmission project adjacent to the Ann Arbor Railroad tracks and the DTE substation line. If you'll turn your attention to the monitors, you'll see the zoning map and the highlighted <laughs> parcel. It's at the um, end of the Research Park Drive in that um, in the cul-de-sac type area. The next slide is the aerial of the property just south of I-94. And you see the surrounding properties and the railroad, uh, or the, um, yeah, the railroad line runs right through here and that's where the transmission line will be. And a uh, zoomed in aerial photo of the property. This is the survey that was submitted with the application, the boundary survey, and the highlighted area shows the easement area. <coughs> this is um, the route survey that was submitted with the application. You see the, um, the route where the um, transmission lines will be running. These are the photos I took when I was out at the park. This is the entrance to the property. This is the east side of the property, and you see um, 94 right here, and you see some of the transmission lines that have been installed. Next slide is looking uh, down south along the transmission line in the um, western side of the property. And this is some of the um, vegetation that was previously there that was removed that was um, not ex uh, required landscape parking islands, just some um, vegetation that was in the um, transmission line easement area. And these are um, existing conditions. These are some of the landscape islands that never had, have not had trees in them for quite a long time. I can, we've had this uh, pr three previous cases in July. I think you'll remember, very similar. It's just a different applicant tonight. Um, I can take any questions at this time if you have any. Yes, Dave. The three cases were on the other side of the highway, I think. Yeah, they were on Victor's Way. So if you look at the previous slide, 
I think. So these ones just above? Yeah, on Victor's way right up in here, this area right here. And so th is this roughly the same situation as we encountered then? It is. Thank you very much. Any other questions for staff? Okay, with that, um, we'll, we'll allow the petitioner to please sign in and uh, tell us what you're asking for. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mr. Boardman. I am here on behalf of ITC um, and seeking the variance today. Uh, we do not, I, there was one other comment made in the staff report that I just want to clear up. We don't actually represent the property owner. I, I represent uh, ITC. And this is, I watched the video of the last time, the July proceedings. I'm, I'm, does everybody recall the project or do yes. you want me to go back mm -hmm. over it at all? Or? Nope. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so uh, you probably have seen the lines are up, they're constructed, they go over the expressway right, nor, uh, right there uh, by the Intec property. Um, the, all of the vegetation that was within the easement area that's going to be removed has been removed. Um, I have a, I can, I can show you a description if you want to see what was there, what was removed. It was largely brush, but there were some trees. Um, there were sort of volunteer growing trees in the very corner of the property that were removed. Um, but again, it's all at the back of the property. You can't see it from uh, the, um, the road. Uh, I think that it actually looks pretty nice. I mean, the line looks pretty nice, but I'm, I'm, I'm biased. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. And then the only other thing that I would say, the, the reason that this is slightly different than the last variance request is that they were specifically seeking, we were, on those properties, we were specifically seeking a variance from the, from, for trees that were removed from the islands. And that was not the situation here. Just trees that was, were otherwise denoted on the, on the same plan. I will just say one thing real quick. So where I was standing taking that photo, um, this is where the uh, brush on the adjacent property was removed, so it wasn't really actually part of this property. And it was truly just scrub brush. It wasn't required trees, no required landscaping, no hardwoods, no mature trees. And that's why that was in that, that picture, but from where I was standing. Are there any questions for the petitioner? Hearing none, would anybody else like to speak to the zoning board about this issue? Would anybody like to make a motion? I can make a motion. Okay. Nic Nicole. All right. Uh, this is petition ZBA 19 028 3915 and 3917 Research Park Drive. Variance. Based on the following findings of fact and in accordance with the established standards for approval, the Zoning Board of Appeal hereby grants the following variance from Chapter 55. Unified Development Code Section 5.20, Landscaping, Screening, and Buffering. A variance to allow the removal of required vegetation in the high voltage electrical transmission line easement areas only. A, the alleged practical difficulties are peculiar to the property and result from conditions which do not generally exist throughout the city. B, that the practical difficulties which will result from a failure to grant the variance include substantially more than mere inconvenience inability to attain a higher financial return or both. C, the variance if granted will not significantly affect surrounding properties. D, the circumstances of the variance, variance request are not self-imposed. E, the variance request is the minimum necessary to achieve reasonable use of the land or structure. Is there support? Support. Yes. Sure. Okay, um, Todd? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Charlotte? Yes. Mike Daniel? Yes. I vote yes. Megan? Yes. Nicole? Yes. Okay, the, the motion passes seven to nothing with one member in uh, recusal. Seems a little anti-Semitic after that. <laughs> 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 we'll, go, we'll go with your uh, anyway. <laughs>
moving on. Uh, we have no unfinished business, no new business. We have addressed our communications. Do I have anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Seeing no one, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, support? From Mike, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.